Emily, I'm going to get you to kick off if that's all right. Emily Wilson, editor of The Guardian Australia. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm a Guardian old timer. I've been with the company 16 years, uh, the last two in this country. Um, before that, I was a horrible tabloid hack and I worked at the Mail and the Mirror and the only reason I didn't do any phone hacking was because no one told me how to do it or I would have done it if I'd been asked. And <laughs> Um, and I uh, lead a team of 42 full-time journalists in this country uh, with another sort of 18 quite full-timers on contract. Um, and it's going well. Simon. Simon. I'm Simon Creer. Um, I'm editor of BuzzFeed Australia. I've uh, been in Australia five years. Um, I worked previously in the UK for the Times and Sunday Times for 10 years. Um, in Australia, I worked for News Corp before I've been working for BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed launched two years ago um, on Monday, so the 1st of February, two years ago, we launched. Um, and we now, we launched with three people in Australia, and we now have uh, 30 people here, 23 of them are journalists. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm the Australia editor of Mashable. Um, I started my career at Yahoo before going to news.com.au and joined Mashable a year and a half ago when we kicked off here. Um, we have a smaller team than these guys. Uh, there's four of us in total, and, um, but we work with the US team, which is um, all globally 300 people. Yeah, we actually have three former News Corp staff up here, myself, Simon and Jen, so I don't know what that says, but read into it what you will. Um, Jen, can I just ask you, while we, what, just on the back of your intro, um, uh, we're uh, sort of more familiar with the models at, at BuzzFeed and Guardian, just to give us a little bit of insight. My understanding is that um, Mashable, with your presence here, you're looking to create Australian content, which you then feed back into the US um, presence, not so much to create a, a, an Australian presence the way Guardian Australia has, for instance, um, and that you can then tack on Australian advertising into that into that content. Is that is that the case? Do you want to just give us a little bit of definition around it? Yeah, at the moment, um, it's definitely that with a small team here. So the company um, motto is, I guess, you can do a, a lot with one person and a laptop. Um, so at the moment, we have a global website. Uh, we have an Australian edition, but the only difference is a panel at the top, which you can update manually with Australian content. The rest of the site is the global website. So everyone around the world publishes to that website, um, therefore going out to 43 million people. So I guess what we do here is we look for cool Australian stories that we then want to send out to the world and make them go viral globally. So kind of what we do. Fantastic. Okay, so um, the topic for today is, is digital invaders and all three of the editors up here have been very successful in, in growing their Australian audiences, probably more so than maybe you expected when you set up, from my understanding. Um, I was wondering if we could kick off by asking, why do you think that is? What do you think the legacy media in Australia is missing and what do you think you're bringing to the table that has enabled you to cement a presence so quickly and so strongly? Uh, yeah, no, we didn't expect to do as well as we have. Uh, it, it is simply that many readers have wanted our offering, which is meant to be sort of, you know, fairly serious news, international and national news for Australia. And the stuff they go nuts for on our website is quite dry economics, all our political reporting. Um, uh, quite, they're looking for quite heavy commentary and analysis, as well as jokes and first dog and so forth. Um, we launched because we already had an audience here who were interested in entertainment that BuzzFeed um, is well known for. So we started off with a small team doing uh, identity-based content around, um, you know, in the, in the formats that BuzzFeed is well known for, lists and quizzes. And that's very much where we were for the first sort of 12 months experimenting with understanding the identities. People, uh, BuzzFeed content is mainly distributed by people sharing it. So people sharing it on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. Um, young people, our audience, our core audience is very much 18 to 30 and that's where the majority of our readers are. And so we, we laid a foundation with that and then over the last 12 months we've added in a news team and so we have a politics team, some reporters covering um, various different beats, and they're like identity beats. So we have an indigenous affairs reporter, we have a LGBT reporter, we have a reporter doing gender, and those are things that people really um, you know, want to share and want to really get into because they're really about them. Um, and then um, you know, we have a lifestyle team, and for the last six months we've been doing video, which you may have seen popping up on Facebook. So you know, we're at the stage now, though we're small, that we're kind of full set 
in terms of the different kind of offerings we've got within BuzzFeed. I might just pause it. Sorry, Jen, I'm going to come back to you. But you've, you've said what you've got, but what are the others missing? Why? I mean, you know, the, some of the traditional news organisations in Australia, they're doing Indigenous Round, they're doing, um, you know, entertainment reporting, they're doing Lolcats now, probably a bit too much. Um, what, what are they missing? What's the, what's the gap? I think for us, um, where, where we have allowed, uh, has, have made a big impact really quickly is because we're really, really good at social. And that's um, you know, our distribution method. We have a very small number of people coming to our homepage as the, uh, in terms of the, the, the stories. So like for us, Facebook is the homepage or Twitter is the homepage, Pinterest, the places where people are consuming content. And really, you know, we're in competition, not so much with traditional Australian media or with The Guardian or Mashable, but with the things that people do every day in the morning when they flick open their phone. You know, that's a, they can be looking at photos of their family around the world or things their friends did last night, or they can be looking at a piece of content from our website. And that's you know, where we are. And increasingly, people aren't even coming to buzzfeed.com. They're basically spending time you know, on instant articles. And, and you know, we were uh, one of the launch partners there. And I know that now the Fairfax are, are doing that in Australia. But you know, I think our adv advantage and what we're doing really, really well is kind of being ahead of the curve and uh, being where like, the audience is going and figuring out our business on the back of that. Jen, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I definitely think we're not precious with where our content is. The same, we don't care about our homepage as much as we do about social. I think most of our traffic, uh, well, 45% of our traffic comes through social and only 15% through our homepage. So it's um, more a branding destination than it is uh, where our content is picked up and read. Um, also, we, I think what we do differently to uh, our legacy media is the way we use technology. Um, and so we have tools that help us predict trends, help us predict what uh, people are reading. So uh, we have a tool called Velocity, uh, which we plug in every single news website in Australia and Facebook and Twitter, and it tells us, it predicts shares for us. So I can tell that a story that someone wrote on, say, The Age is about to get uh, 5,000 shares, and I might want to jump on an angle of that story, find my own angle, and then um, follow through with that. So we've, we've got these predictive tools that just make it a lot easier for us. Um, it allows us to be lean, allows me to work with you know two journalists and myself and publish a lot of content that our audience definitely wants to read. And all of the publications have um, some bespoke tools, um, I think, is my understanding. So The Guardian has, um, obviously, its analytics engine and I, I understand a user generated content verification engine that was we've developed. Got, we've got an in-house thing called OFAN, mm -hmm. which is just the most brilliant, amazing tool. Every journalist has it. It's on your screen the whole time, so it's kind of a mixture of a sort of super sophisticated heat map. And then if you go through to article level, there's just nothing you can't find out about who's reading that piece, how, when, where they're going. It, it's just tremendous. BuzzFeed obviously has had a lot of publicity around its algorithm tool for predicting virality of, of news stories. And, and as you mentioned, um, Mashable has some similar, some similar tools. Yeah, definitely. Like, the tools are really important for us. And I think you know, we're a technology company as much as we're a media company. And a third of our, of our uh, staff are um, people working on our technology side. And data is really good. Analytics is really good. But actually, I think the way we're cutting through is because we're actually just really good at being in the internet and understanding that that's actually a place that things happen and, and reporting happens. And that's where, um, you know, I, th I think we, we can be a little bit different from t uh, legacy players. Um, and, you know, it's still, you know, we, we're not so interested in what's um, trending on the age or what's happening on another website. We're actually interested in getting inside the internet and finding where the stories are and writing the original first take ourselves and actually breaking news, that's like a real ambition in terms of making impact, it's like original reporting. Unfortunately though, some of those tools are bespoke and they are unique to each of the publications. What do you think more generally for working journalists out there are gonna be some of the transformative technologies going forward and what do you think journalists nowadays need to be able to do or know to operate in multi-platform newsrooms? Um, I think, uh Process tools are becoming really important. Um, so we use tools such as Trello, which is a planning tool. So our newsroom runs on that. Um, when I write a story or one of my staff writes a story, they post a card and then that gets picked up by an editor wherever around the world and then gets published and this card gets moved along this planning tool. Uh, with that, we use Slack as well, which um, I'm sure a lot of people use, So, um, which is a chat program that lets us be um, in sync with the rest of the globe and not working, I guess, in a little pillar in Australia. Anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, we definitely use tools, as you probably know. We have now 11 editions globally, so we're in a kind of daily conversation with New York, with LA, with London, 
uh, with our newsrooms in now in Tokyo, and Mumbai, in our region. So there's a kind of global conversation. So certainly, chat software is really important. Um, but I think, as much as anything, I, I think with my guys, it's it's about um, mastering the technology, using it, harnessing it, looking at the data, listening to the audience, having a really good feedback loop, but also not losing sight of the fact that like a story actually a lot of the time exists beyond all that technology, and actually like um, you know getting out there, you know, um, you know, getting feet leather on the ground, foot leather on the ground, walking and speaking to people is just as important. Yeah, and and the 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 the, the basic rules are completely unchanged. Whatever platform you're working for, and that's not being a credulous idiot, and and not taking what you're fed as fact, and not believing that there's some Vietnamese guy called fuck that bitch just because he put a picture up on Facebook of his passport or whatever. The, the key tenets of journalism, did you do, did according you do to story? Emily. <laughs> we broke that fuck that bitch was not called that's fuck that bitch. That's very good. So the hoax blasting is really good. I mean, we didn't do that story. We passed on it, but somebody in our LA office did it. Um, I'm going to ask one more general question before I move on to spe some specific questions for each of you, and then we'll move on to audience questions. Um, there's always been a separation of church and state in that money has never been... It's never been, you know, um, discussed by editors or it's been kept very much at arm's length from editors. Um, I get the sense that that shift is, that, that there is a shift there and that editors are being asked, you know, to contribute to um, development of, of models and, and for input. How much responsibility do each of you feel to contribute to that process of trying to find a model that works financially? Obviously, there's a huge amount of pressure, not just to break even, but to make money so that you can invest in the kinds of tools that you guys are talking about. Or is there no pressure there at all? Yeah, the, the, I feel com it's completely my duty to uh, make sure that we survive forever. So uh, our big push this year is membership, and unless the whole of editorial is completely behind it and involved in every bit of it, it won't work. I do also think that editors have always been interested in whether their businesses are making money. I don't think that's an, anything new, and I think you know, for us, we have a kind of clear line of church and state in that like, the people who are, who are reporting are not the people who are making the, the native advertising. They're different teams. But certainly, look, I, like Emily, have a real interest in BuzzFeed being a sustainable business and being a business that grows. And so it's definitely in my interest if I can you know, share some of the insights into what our audience are interested in with our business team, and that can allow them to create really compelling content for brands. You know, I don't think, you know, I think if, if our reporters um, uh, were ever, you know, being tasked with actually writing like some of our competitors are in this market, content um, about brands, then I think that that would definitely not be something that um, you know, I'd be happy with, but that's not something for our, that we're worrying about, so. Yeah, same way, church and state, so there's no crossover um, besides us being very interested in our traffic and feeding that back in, much like Simon. Um, obviously, there's been quite a lot of publicity around The Guardian and some cost-cutting um, news that's come out of the UK because of the CEO saying that uh, there's too much financial pressure being put on the trust and that the business has to be self-sustaining and that there needs to be a push towards it. Um, as some of as as that as part of that conversation, there's been discussion that the Australian Guardian Australia has been given two years to make profit or at least break even. Um, and there's also been, sorry, I'm doing double barreling, which is breaks every tenet of journalism, but that's fine. Um, and also that there's been some discussion around Graham Wood and the relationship um, with him, who's one of the investors um, in Guardian Australia. Um, where's the truth in all uh, of this? So th there's been no discussion other than some really pernicious and, and untrue reporting in the Australian. Um, we are doing 20% cuts in London, and part, not to underplay the seriousness, but in my 16 years at The Guardian, we've, we've sort of yo-yoed. We've periodically hired loads of digital people, then we've had a round of redundancies, then we've hired more people than we've had. So this is another round. Or, well, not necessarily redundancies, it's another round of cuts, but Australia is completely um, insulated from that, as is our American operation. So, but for how long? Uh, well, actually here we're a separate financial body. So we'll, we, we don't cost London anything, and we never will. Um, in terms of this sort of two-year thing, we have a five-year business plan, and the plan is that by the time we run through our investment, we'll be in profit, and we are absolutely to a pin on track with that original business plan. How's the relationship with Graham Wood? Um, he's... An, an ideal investor. I don't. I don't have a relationship with him at all. I, I've met him about three or four times. He seemed very nice. Um, he has no contact with the journalists. Um, 
he, he recently sort of came out after the Australian ran a story about he might call in his loan. He went to the Finn and gave some sort of interview, but he didn't tell me he was going to do that, and we had no contact since. So he's a perfect investor for journalists. In that he stays well out of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Simon, um, recently we saw um, BuzzFeed in the UK have a massive, massive scoop um, with the tennis, um, the tennis story. Um, which I'm sure most people in the room would be aware of. Um, when I was listening to some of the coverage of that story on um, ABC Radio, I think it was, they were talking about the tie-up between BuzzFeed and BBC, and they felt the need to describe BuzzFeed as an online news outlet. They didn't offer any such explanation of what the BBC was. Um, despite the fact that um, BuzzFeed is still breaking news, they've got... Uh, you guys have done some amazing work on the Indigenous round in particular with a Walkley nomination. Um, somehow you're still often pegged in the lolcat basket, I think, by a lot of people. Um, how frustrating is that for you and how much do you have to do before that doesn't happen anymore? Um, I don't think it's too frustrating, to be honest. I mean, I've sat in Gavin Morris's office and talked to and he's clearly very aware about what BuzzFeed is and I think that you need to think about who the ABC's audience are. It's above 60 on average and they probably don't know what BuzzFeed is. And so I don't think we need to do too much explaining to um, the majority of young Australians who are consuming our content what we are. I think the tie-up with the BBC, this is a, a story that um, was worked on in our London and New York offices. It took a whole year of, of work and it's, it's not finished yet, it's, it's just begun really. And we've seen you know, an amazing impact really in, in the press conference yesterday and the very serious nature of how it's been taken by seven different tennis bodies coming together. Um, the tie-up with the BBC was a way of amplifying the story. You know, we are um, a new, uh, as a New York organisation in, in the UK and in Australia. And so uh, tying with a, you know, a, a, a brand like the BBC in order to get the story out. And um, Heidi um, appeared on ABC News you know, very shortly after the BBC News story broke. She had a, 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 an ABC News interview here in Australia. So you know, we're working with partners and we've got some other things coming up in Australia with partners as a way of kind of taking our, our journalism and our storytelling out to a bigger audience. We're very good with our core audience. We have um, you know, a really good kind of saturation with um, young um, you know, millennial Australians under 30 but we're very keen to kind of broaden our brand out into other people as well. Can you say anything about the other partners that you're working with in Australia? Uh, not at the moment, but uh, it'll become apparent very soon within the next few weeks. Ooh, the next few weeks. Um, Emily, have you got any similar partnerships coming up that you wanted to...? No. Damn it. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Jan, um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about um, what your Australian audience looks like and how you're planning to grow it um, going forward. Um, you've said that you're not, you, you're not looking to be, at this point, a destination like Mashable Australia, the way that Guardian Australia is um, a destination site with a dedicated homepage. But is that something you'll be looking at in future? And are you looking to get more staff and bulk up? Yeah, we're, we're definitely looking to expand here. Um, it's just, as I said, we like to be lean and we like to check out the market first, so that's what we're doing. Um, and I guess then we are, we are a destination in the fact we do have an Australia homepage. It's just that under that, I guess, everything feeds in globally. I don't think there's any view to change that model. It works really well for us. It helps us find content in regions and share it um, in a region that wouldn't normally get it. Um, we're definitely looking at subject areas that have gone well for us, which are social good, um, environment has done really well for us in science and we still have a very much our core in tech um, and also pushing really into the viral because as much as we want to explore tech and do longer form stories there, viral is where our traffic is based. So it's just like trying to keep that balance as we, as we grow and um, yeah, get some uh, good reporters on, on board and definitely push more into original content. Are you able to give any numbers around Australian kind of audiences or is that not something Mashable breaks out? We, yeah, we don't break out our... Oh, I tried. I keep trying and <laughs> that's all right. Um, I think we might open up to some audience questions now. If anyone's got anything they'd like to ask, if they could stick a hand up, that would be great. Hi, I'm Melissa Singer from The Age. Um, we've got an election, federal election, coming up this year. And the last election, or, and the one before in particular, were known as the Twitter elections. What do you think will be new and different about the media coverage of this year's federal election? 
and how are you guys um, starting to plan and strategize around it without giving away too many trade secrets? Well, I think Facebook has made, made massive inroads into trying to be more um, aligned with what the things people are talking about. And I think we've seen that now Facebook is a place, obviously, that all of us get a lot of traffic for, but it's a place that news is surfaced much quicker. It used to be that the Facebook sort of trending algorithm was a day behind, and now it's very, very current. So I think if people are sharing politics on Facebook, definitely that's somewhere we're going to be. We've now uh, globally got a, a big percentage of our views come from Snapchat. So I imagine you'll probably see some Snapchat from BuzzFeed in the election. Um, and certainly, you know, the integration of Periscope into Twitter now, where it's actually inside the app, I think we'll see quite a lot of stuff from organizations like ourselves, where people are like out on the road, on campaign, and um, reporting in real time. So yeah, I think it's shaping up to be um, like a really exciting election. Obviously, the government are really focused on innovation, they're really focused on technology. Um, and I think that, you know, I think it's going to, uh, more than any election we've seen so far in Australia, going to allow uh, the public to feel very part of it and to be very involved in being able to grill politicians and, and, and actually, you know, get direct answers out of them. So I think we're really excited about it. I just want to add a little question onto the end of that. Um, we've seen Twitter obviously um, release some pretty miserable growth um, figures. Is, is it the end of Twitter? Is Twitter over? I don't think so. I mean, Rupert's about to buy Twitter, is he not? Sorry, he's... Oh, well, Rupert's apparently... Rupert's um, apparently about to buy everything. With, well, I mean, and he's got a great track record with technology companies, with um, <laughs> social <laughs> networks and stuff. So, yeah. So, no, I don't think... I think, you know, Twitter is obviously something that news, um, like news junkies, journalists use obsessively. It's a tool that in all of our newsrooms, people spend all day on. I wish I could kind of turn it off for people half the time. But, um, you know, it's a great place to source stories. And, you know, um, Mark DeStefano, our political editor, had a brilliant scoop last year where he tracked down... Mark Latham and find that um, the, the Mark, Latham. It, Mark Latham was a lot later. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> um, and that's why I think you guys are going to be blessed with Mark Latham pretty soon, apparently, at the age. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, definitely, I think Twitter isn't going to go anywhere um, in this election cycle. And I think that going forward, I think, um, you know, I think it's the kind of thing that people are so obsessive about that even if Twitter can't make money for it, I think somebody else will come along and help it out. Anyone want to add anything? Oh, I think I got covered. I just see Twitter as just, it's just a great, this is a completely necessary news tool rather yeah. than any kind of influence on any election. I mean, obviously little storms blow up and they, but everyone knows that they blow up and yeah. the, the sort of importance of Twitter storms is fading, don't you feel? Yeah. I think, I think we're all a bit over it. The outrage is fading, I yeah. I think a, like a Twitter storm is basically like, I'm sure if everybody's using the same hashtag in this room, it would become into the top 10 trending topics on Twitter. Yeah, BuzzFeed So it's not out. really like a, you know, yeah, it's a small market, but it's actually an integral tool for journalism and it's, you know, it's a, a great way for a reporter to basically interrogate anyone. You don't have to, um, you know, if somebody's on Twitter, you can ask them direct questions and, and get at anyone. So it's a great tool for readers as well to get in touch with journalists. So yeah, it's fabulous. I think we have a question over here. Hi, question for Emily. Um, Alan Rusbridger is on the record as saying that The Guardian isn't the Taliban of the free when it comes to subscription. And Kath Vine has also said it's not off the table. Do you see a future where there might be a limited subscription for, say, investigative articles, or is the future instant Facebook articles? Um, our, so we had a big kind of strategic announcement last week, and it was about membership being at the kind of the number one thing this year, which is all about getting closer to our readers. It's also about us making money out of membership. What we offer to members is being completely rethought. It could involve some content, but nothing's in or out. It could involve, you know, special essays that other people have to buy afterwards. It could involve, you know, nothing is in or out on, but the, I'd be very surprised if anything that core was ever only available to members. And investigative journalism, I would say, was core. Um, what about instant articles on Facebook? Yeah, we, we're constantly doing sort of many, many different trials on many, many different platforms. Um, what, what do you mean? How does it relate to your financial question? What do you see a future whereby that's what happens? Well, uh, I mean, we, we, we obviously publish on all digital platforms all the time. Um, some platforms we make some money back for putting it there and some, some platforms give us nothing. Um, that's why membership, which is completely independent of any kind of platform-based monetization, is the focus this year. 
I'm very keen, and Emily knows this, to give The Guardian some money. And I've been trying for about 20 years to give The Guardian some money. Um, I, for a few years, gave The Guardian money for five pounds a month for an eyewitness app. It's a brilliant app that used to have on the iPads, which was beautiful photography, which they closed down, so I couldn't give you any more money. So I've been asking for the subscription to become but a member in Australia, and I think that'd be a fabulous yeah. thing. But if you want to sort of sign up to be a member, it is actually quite hard. I think about 90% of people give up even trying to get through. So the team this year are going to make it really, really easy for people who want to contribute. And given that paywalls is a big discussion here in Australia, I think it's been very interesting. I, as I said, worked at the Times for five years, and, and the Times launched a paywall in 2010, and everyone laughed at it and ridiculed it. And this year, the, the Guardian has apparently lost, or will lose, 80 million pounds, and the Times, in, which has a, a paywall digital strategy, is in profit. So I think it's very interesting to see, like, you know, going forward, that's looking back five years, going forward five years, where these things will shake out. We're not losing, we're not losing 80 million pounds, losing about 50, which we've, we've actually done before. Yeah. So it's not like our first time. And the New York Times can't be compared to anything else because it's the New York Times. Well, that was so the London, London Times. Oh, but no one reads the Times. What's the point? I mean, <laughs> like, who would... Who would uh, why would you... I'm not, I'm not going to defend... So I'm not for journalists to be writing for four people, you know. So well, I mean, I think the Times of London that, sells yeah. 400,000 copies a day versus maybe, the 120 maybe. that are going to Whatever, whatever. Well, no, it's 200. And also we've got 140 million readers online, which we won't forget. Um, but the point is, <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's interesting yeah. that the model, the model of paywall, the model of paywall versus free. Yeah. You know, we're a free website as well. Yeah. We have to make money. We're creating native content, and and our entire future is we're never going to charge people to read Buzzfeed. Yeah. But I think it's very interesting for traditional legacy companies who are giving away their content for free. And I think I, I always see on comments that people would like to give the Guardian money. So I think they will find ways of, of uh, exclusive club for investigations or something like that to make money. Yeah, I think that part of the debate around paywalls is actually because, you know, you look at the Wall Street Journal, which is niche in the sense that they're a specialist publication. The Times has an overwhelmingly loyal readership, which would be willing to... to but when you look at the more broad publications that have a broader readership base, it becomes a more difficult proposition. Um, we're going to go to the next question just here. Sorry, for Emily, um, can we assume that if The Guardian goes bust in London, you're so independent here that you won't be affected? Uh, okay, we're not going to go bust in London. Uh, we're not going to go bust in London, so it's complete. I mean, we're, uh, with that, we're touching wood. Um, uh, uh, we're so lucky to have the, the big fund that we do to, to be a trust. Uh, we're doing these cuts so that nothing is going to happen to us so and i have complete faith in the leadership in london who are going to who are going to make any savings that need to be saved and make money and sort out membership so but in terms of us being a separate entity we obviously have this huge flood of foreign news coming through the site every day and so without london we would be we would be missing all that so i mean a big part of what we do here is we do national news here, and we offer national and international news to Australia, but also we're part of the Guardian's 24-hour news machine. So if anything big happens in France on our watch, uh, the whole team might just do France. So, so that when the rest of the world wakes up, the whole website's full of um, completely live content. So we are, we are part of the machine as well. Yeah, okay, second question for anybody on the panel. When did mainstream media become legacy media. It sounds like something out of World War One. <laughs> legacy media, where did this come from? Uh, I think legacy media is, is companies that were in existence before the internet arrived. And so a company that was pre the invention of the World Wide Web, I guess. I mean, uh, most legacy companies are on the internet as well, but companies that are pure internet companies are, are the new, I guess, and everything else is legacy. I, I think it, it refers to people who've got papers still, which makes me legacy as well. Okay. Um, I would say that uh, we're a pure digital company where we, Mashable is probably more like a tech company than it is a media company in some ways. Um, yeah, I wear, worked at News Corp. I think the inner workings of uh, Mashable and probably BuzzFeed are a little different to the way News Corp or Fairfax uh, run. And we, we don't have 
the the staff that have been there to we can just start from scratch pretty much. So I guess that makes us a little different. Here we go. David Poulton from Middle and thank you, uh, panel. And this is just really for the panel as well. I just want to ask a sort of a general question about um, where you see the future going for what I could describe as audience identity on anonymity on the internet. I mean, so much of what you see these days in terms of audience participation, for example, in stories, comments on, on stories on, on those legacy websites particularly, um, is a mixture of, uh, I don't know, trolling and obsessives and out-and-out -out lunatics, it seems. You would hope that's, that's what it is because there's not a lot of uh, intelligent commentary that you see in those comment sections. And I think a lot of that is perhaps to do with the anonymity. And indeed, we talk about Twitter and trying to identify whether it's the real Mark Latham or not, all those sort of issues. I wonder where you see that going. Are we going to have a more um, orthodox um, and identified and, and um, accountable, if you like, participation from audiences in the future, or are we just going to continue with this kind of um, narcissistic free-for-all that we have now? Well, our comments on, on BuzzFeed are, are Facebook comments, so they're, they're uh, in theory, if you're commenting on Facebook, you're a real person, it's, um, in theory, yeah, there are definitely um, some people on Facebook who aren't exactly who they claim to be, they set up a fake email, all those things, but I think it's much more verified than not. Um, and certainly, like, one of the issues I think that's very interesting in, in media here in Australia is related to how um, the comments are moderated and how we keep on top of those things, where a site like BuzzFeed Australia, which now has, um, you know, more, more Facebook fans than the ABC, you know, 1.8 million we have, uh, it's, it's a, a daily moderation uh, that's ongoing. And we know, for instance, we publish a lot of, um, you know, in, uh, interesting uh, video content and uh, like long form reporting around uh, Australia Day and, that, and what it means to Indigenous people, and you know it, it, it brings a whole load of people out of the woodwork who are, are you know are uh, as you say trolls or um, really keen for a fight and saying you know racist objectionable things, which you know because of the nature of how many people are on the page, it's like you know r very many lots of people's eyeballs on that just to make sure that we keep on top of it. So yeah, it's it's an area that I think that the. the platform is well ahead of the law in some ways and certainly well ahead of, of how people have thought about it in terms of legislation. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a big issue, a live issue, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Do you, do you yeah. Our attitude to comments is, is constantly under scrutiny but sort of fluctuates. When we uh, opened a big operation in America, there the policy is you just have comments over on everything because everyone does and otherwise you're stifling debate, which led to loads of sort of cultural clashes around the world where the, the tolerance in America for, for really bad stuff is much higher than here, yeah. Um, we have some stuff where you just get amazing debate and then you get some stuff where it, we just turn off comments. We just go. We don't have the. We don't have enough moderators to, to deal with that. So stuff them. Yeah, we don't have comments on our news stories either. We have them on our our entertainment and our buzz stories, but not on our news stories. Yeah, we just turn comments on same as that. So on no controversial articles and um, mainly on things where people want to have a debate. But I guess because we have a tech core for our website, it doesn't happen as much as say when I was at news.com.au. But it could also be the amount of traffic coming through. Um, also, a lot of our debate. Uh, goes on on Twitter, so it's sort of off platform, so we can just ignore it. <laughs> but you listen, sure. We listen, yeah. Um, so, uh, question. Where's the mic? There's, there you are. There's a question here. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Hi, Jenna from Think HQ. Um, I've got a question. In terms of um, your content itself, um, you say both of you say that you're a predominantly tech company rather than a news company. What does that mean then for your ethics and values in terms of journalism being a fourth estate? Like, yeah, what does that mean to you? Yeah, um, it's exactly the same. So we, we still chase stories exactly the same. The only thing that has changed for us is a platform. So even though we operate internally like a tech company, we have investors, we were, we were set up by a founder. Um, my boss is a New York Times veteran. Um, so. Yeah, he was there for 26 years. He's brought all those ideals over. I don't get away with anything. Um, and neither do my team. So on every story we do, we make a call. We often send a journal out. We definitely do not just sit behind a desk and even though we do just sit behind a desk and pop out stories, any chance we get, we get, we get out there and get amongst it. And we tap into our global network as well to get original content. So 
yeah, the same. Uh, we're definitely like a, a have a core of um, being a tech company, but we have you know more. We have 400 uh, journalists around the world, and um, I think you know. Uh, Similarly, we have many people who have great experience. Um, Janine Gibson, who used to work for the Guardian, sending us in the UK. Um, ben worked at, um, at many, um, you know, Politico and um, the New York Observer before he was with us. So we've got, uh, you know, a lot of experience in there among some of our senior editors. But also we have um, our, um, you know, head of news, Shani Hilton, who's in her twenties but has written some amazing editorial standards and ethics guide, which is public on our website, which we're all held to, which is a living, breathing document which was um, you know, really very, very clear about the standards that our, our reporters are set to, our, our editorial standards and the way that we report. So you know, we're very, very focused on that. And also about having a really strong feedback loop. So there's a real opportunity for people to raise issues, public raise issues with our reporting and for it to be addressed and, and really clear standards about how we correct and how we change if the, something in our articles is found to be wrong. So yeah, we're really, really kind of focused on that. But I think it's quite a common experience, maybe not for you guys, but in media companies the last five years, the, the sort of tectonic plate shifts between commercial digital development and editorial and who, who really owns the company and who's in charge and who owns, for example, if you're making a website, who owns that website? Is, is, the, is the product the website or the, or the words on it or the advert? Anyway, so all our internal struggles over the last five years, I think have been mirrored across Europe and America in, from that. But Ultimately, we are really clear ourselves that we are a journalism company. Sorry, it's hard to see, so I'm just going to throw in one more quick question before we go back to the audience. Um, you talked about, you know, getting out from behind the desk. Um, all three of your publications are fairly Sydney-centric, I think it's fair to say. Um, and The Guardian, I know, has had a little bit of criticism for, for instance, live blogging news events from Sydney when they're not in Sydney, they're elsewhere. Um, what are your plans to um, expand and have more of an Australian presence um, and have bureau elsewhere? Can I just say, many of our biggest stories ever have been live blogs of things happening in different countries. So I think if you can, with huge intelligence and poise, live blog Paris, I don't really see why you can't live blog something in Darwin from Sydney. And also, I'm very jealous of the fact that Emily has a reporter in Darwin and a reporter in Perth, but a team in Melbourne and uh, reporters in Brisbane. And certainly, you know, as we go forward, we're uh, you know, a little bit younger than The Guardian in Australia, but we're hoping that we will expand and we will have reporters around the country. Certainly in the meantime, what we do is we send, um, you know, Lane, our LGBT reporter to Adelaide to cover, um, you know, uh, their uh, you know, st strange laws relating to adoption for gay parents. And we send Alan to WA or the Northern Territory. So we get our reporters out there. Um, but yeah, our ambition is definitely to be thought of as a national publication. Yeah, I agree. Um, so even when it was just me at Mashable, with a laptop, I can be anywhere and I can be reporting from there, but I can be filing on other stories. So um, I was over in Hong Kong when the uh, pro-democracy uh, protests kicked off there. So Mashable does have uh, the ability to send anyone anywhere. So we can do the same thing from Sydney or Melbourne or wherever we need to go. I think we have a question over here. Yeah. Sue Olsen from 120 Ways Publishing. I'm just interested in uh, video content. How much can you see uh, the content moving towards video in the future and as a percentage of your overall content? Uh, well, uh, when I started at BuzzFeed, uh, we didn't really have anything video-wise and we now have 150 producers in LA producing video content. We have a news team producing news videos in, in um, New York. And we have a couple of video producers here in Australia who've created some huge video hits for us. We've been exploring some more serious stuff about um, identity, about uh, women wearing a hijab or being uh, people talking about aspects of their identity, uh, Aboriginal identity. Um, and we're, you know, we're very focused on identity, so we're really interested in multicultural Australia and how we explore that through video. Um, and also we do a whole load of really uh, very BuzzFeed, kind of ridiculous scenario-based things like yesterday we did a video of what it's like to go to work after a, a public holiday where everybody's asleep or walking around um, drunk or you know, re regretting the things they uploaded to Facebook. So you know, we're very kind of tuned into different types of video, crazy food videos, that things you can make and you know, throw together with three ingredients. But I think going forward, I mean, it seemed to us that last year video was explosive on the internet, on YouTube, on Facebook. And apparently, according to um, you know, Facebook, this year is going to be an even bigger year. So I think you know, for every publisher, um, it's an amazing way. We use it as a launch pad for investigation. So with the tennis story, we had a short um, you know, two-minute documentary that went live on Facebook that then linked people back to the article, and it drove a huge amount of traffic. 
So I think for, for, um, for newspaper companies as well, it's a great way of getting people in. And I know that broadcasters, the ABC, et cetera, are working you know, to really kind of try and condense so that, for instance, the Four Corners on Monday about tennis, they're going to have some short package things that are going to get people who might not otherwise watch it in to watch the TV show. So yeah, I think it's a really good way of driving people back to your kind of main kind of product. But a lot of video doesn't work on the internet as well. Like uh, a lot of media companies, including people like us, have just done so many experiments over the last 10 years. And w we now know that making sort of TV programs on the internet is a, a fool's errand. That uh, there's just like there's just loads and loads of things that have been done wrong and done badly. People don't necessarily click on video on a website, but they might on different platforms or if it's differently represented. And I think there was a great hope that it was going to save everyone commercially, and that didn't happen. And if you just look at the heat map every day, people really don't click on video much. You need to do something really special and extraordinary to make them click. I think the thing is for us, uh, they're not looking at video on BuzzFeed. Our video has never been on BuzzFeed. It's always been on YouTube. Now it's on Facebook. Um, more than 20% of our views, our content views are on Snapchat. So you, know, you, ha you have to go to where people are, to the social network, to the device, to they're looking at on Vine or they're looking on Instagram to, and put your content there and monetize there um, and put your journalism there. And so I think thinking about people coming to The Age or to The Herald Sun and, and actually looking at it, that's not where they're going to look at it. They're going to look at it in the palm of their hand most of the time. Uh, do you want to quickly add to this? Oh, yeah. I just think you need to be a bit more creative with video, as Emily said. So no talking heads. And that's definitely what we try to do at Mashable. Like, we've had growth like this with... We went from zero to 100 people in New York just working on video, so it's definitely a big push for us still. Hello, uh, Sebastian from uh, SMS Global. Um, I guess, you know, as we move forward, a lot of, a lot of brands globally, um, you know, big companies, they're sort of starting to click onto the idea that they can be publishers as well. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot a lot of a lot of you know big big marketing budgets now are starting to be pushed towards developing and producing their own content with the idea of becoming you know publishers and themselves. Um, you know, say GoPro as an example would be a good company that's like that. They've they've more or less developed their own media platform. How do you how do you how do you see that affecting? Um, I guess the media industry overall in the future. I mean, I guess there's two sides to that. There's those companies that are going to be spending that, mo that money that they would have given to you guys on their own content and building their own audiences. Um, but there's also, from the audience perspective, of them actually you know, spending more of their media consumption time with brands. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting. I mean, we're you know, a native publisher, so we work very closely with brands directly on their messaging and their campaigns, and we're working with them on video as well. But I think definitely that's a big challenge um, in the way to shift. You know, you, you look at here, on, here in Melbourne, the AFL of 100 people who are journalists working, creating content for the AFL. So, you know, there's, there's no necessarily, um, you know, they, 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 all these brands can set up their own media arms, and they do, and you know, even public service, the police and stuff do. I think for us, um, the, the kind of, um, you know, the way that on our news side we'll differentiate ourselves is our objectivity. And you can't expect, um, if it's news related, a brand to be objective at all. So it's really just about promoting. But certainly in terms of media spend, it's definitely going to be a big factor. Yeah, and often we take that content off and turn it into an amazing editorial piece so about the brand. So it's often good for us for content so you're and things the as brand. well. No, 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 like doing, like, say, an ad, like doing a, a piece about an ad because it's going off with users on YouTube or, or wherever and then turning that into an editorial piece about whatever this ad is about or... I think By My Burina was a really good example of where a piece of uh, content by a brand actually became a news story. So is that too? So unfortunately, we, we're running out of time. I'm actually going to um, take a great liberty and ask the last question because um, <laughs> I'm allowed to do that because I'm up here. Um, I was wondering if each of you could give us the three biggest topics or stories that you think we're going to see in 2016, what you plan to focus on. It could be a subject area or a particular story. Um, and and what, what we can expect for the rest of the year. Well, we're going to be focused on uh, the election, of course, like everyone else in Australia, um, and the different ways I think that we're going to cover it are through uh, live video and um, through thinking about identity as a key kind of driver, so thinking about the gender issues, thinking about race issues as a way into getting into um, the, the issues that resonate with our audience. And I think we're definitely also going to really expand what we do with video and um, keep on challenging people's perceptions of what BuzzFeed is. Uh, we, 
we sort of ha aside from the sort of general churn of news, we have five topic areas where we try to go really hard, and in in including Canberra, um, Im immigration slash boats, uh, civil liberties, indigenous affairs, and we we don't see any reason to give up on any of those core areas. Yeah, we're going to be looking more into regional Australia and finding interesting stories there to then, of course, send out to the world and, and to Australia as a whole. Um, we'll be focusing on environment and with that science, um, which we already do, so pushing into that more, and um, social good, which also works for us, so it's just telling beautiful stories to, to the globe from Australia. Um, we could go on for another hour. There, I know there are lots of questions we didn't get to in the audience. I apologise. Um, please join me in thanking our panellists who've been brilliant today. Thank you.